Hello and welcome to what I hope will be a new series called The Science of Metal Gear Solid. It all depends on whether this episode gets enough views and support. We'll begin with The Science of MGS1. Nineteen ninety eight's Metal Gear Solid was written during the Human Genome Project, a massive undertaking which began in nineteen ninety. You've heard of the Human Genome Project. They've been mapping the human genome, and they're nearly finished. Heralded as the largest collaborative scientific venture since the Manhattan Project, the Human Genome Project set out to provide, for the first time, a complete map of the human being on a genetic level. This ambitious project had the potential not only to tell us once and for all who we are and where we've come from, but also to set the stage for where we are going. Following up on this research, the military has been working towards identifying those genes which are responsible for making effective soldiers. There are genes that do that? Yes. And using gene therapy, they're able to transplant those genes into regular soldiers. Gene therapy? I'll explain this part. With gene therapy, we can remove those genes which we know may lead to sickness or disease, and at the same time, splice in genes with beneficial effects, such as resistance to cancer, for example. In other words, we can overcome all sorts of genetic diseases, and at the same time, add genetic characteristics as desired. Genetic factors, in theory, could soon be accounted for, and explain everything from susceptibility to certain diseases, to the killer instinct or so-called warrior's gene. This new frontier of discovery in biology, however, also presented humanity with some philosophical quandaries, and it's from these MGS1 draws most of its themes. Here's a photo of him. <gasps> Pretty shocking, huh? His skin tone is different, but otherwise you two are exact duplicates. I have a twin? Is our destiny written into our DNA? How much can human nature be altered by the burgeoning discipline of genetic engineering? And lastly, what are the ethical implications of such a thing? And doesn't this new interest in the question of genes threaten to bring back to life a version of eugenics? These questions in turn gave MGS1 another key bit of inspiration, namely cloning. Les enfants terribles, the terrible children. That's what the project was called. It started in the 1970s. Their plan was to artificially create the most powerful soldier possible. The person that they chose as the model was the man known then as the greatest living soldier in the world. Big Boss. The twin clones, Solid and Liquid Snake, only differ in their upbringings, even if by the game's end, it's revealed that one of them was engineered with all of their originator's dominant genes, and the other all his recessive. But crucially, the Human Genome Project's relevance for MGS1 can't be separated from the post-Cold War emergence of the US as the leader of a unipolar world. Using cutting-edge science and technology, this American-led New World Order promised that, unlike all empires before it, that this empire would rule impartially, according to benign, even humanitarian, impulses. Science and its relation to power, subsequently, was a major focus for MGS-1 for this reason. After all, much of the scientific and technological progress of the era seemed to allow America to bypass limitations on its own power. Computer-assisted design and supercomputer-driven physical simulations, for example, now could allow the U.S. to develop and even test new types of nuclear weapons without violating any treaties. The excuse of mutual enlightenment, as I've said, allowed for a focus on genetics that came precariously close to restarting eugenics. Can human nature really be trusted to limit itself? Or is there a powerful latent drive in all living beings to amass power to beat out rivals and pass our DNA on? Well, this question brings us to Richard Dawkins and the Selfish Gene. I can read people's minds. In my lifetime, I have read the past, presents, and futures of thousands upon thousands of men and women. 
and each mind that I peered into was stuffed with the same single object of obsession. That selfish and atavistic desire to pass on one seed. It was enough to make me sick. Every living thing on this planet exists to mindlessly pass on their DNA. In MGS1, the character Psycho Mantis explains that all human beings are mindlessly driven to pass on their DNA, and that is why there is war. At the end, Liquid Snake tells us that his shared genes with the Pentagon's secret genome army is why they've banded together to take on the world. You want Big Boss's DNA so you can save your family? It's very touching. In nature, family members don't mate with each other, and yet they help each other to survive. Do you know why? It increases the chance that their genes will be passed on to a new generation. Altruism among blood relatives is a response to natural selection. It's called the selfish gene theory. These elements in MGS1 are direct nods to Dawkins and his selfish gene theory. In The Selfish Gene, written in the mid-70s, Dawkins, a zoologist, posited a theory predicated on genes to explain why, among many other things, perfect peace and harmony, even when it's of mutual benefit, never really happens in the natural world. The reason, at least in Dawkins' view, has to do with what he, by way of another thinker, calls an evolutionarily stable strategy, or ESS. This point is somewhat complex, but roughly the idea is that our genetic predispositions are attuned to what is likeliest to keep our DNA, and with it, its mere meat vehicle, us, alive. That means even when individuals form a collective whole, it remains a decision driven by self-interest on the genetic level. This was one of the ways that Dawkins tried to account biologically for the existence of something like altruism. Now what makes the presence of clones and genetically engineered super soldiers in MGS1 interesting here is how, as artificial beings, they are not the product of natural selection. Humans this violent and powerful aren't supposed to exist, and indeed, according to Liquid, these monstrous half-men were made with a price. They've been designed to be incredibly weak on the genetic level. Have you ever heard of the asymmetry theory? Nature tends to favor asymmetry. Those species which have gone extinct all show signs of symmetry. The genome soldiers suffer from the same problem, signs of symmetry. That's because of what Liquid calls the asymmetry theory. In essence, it has to do with how genetic diversity is necessary for evolution to occur on a micro scale. Think about how royal families by inbreeding gradually became incredibly unfit, genetically speaking. In MGS1's case, this weakness is almost tantamount to immunodeficiency, as the genome soldier's DNA isn't fit enough to repel a foreign invader disease. This is actually why they caused the terrorist incident of the game to force the Pentagon to hand over the genetic legacy of their progenitor, Big Boss. Using gene therapy, it's implied, they plan to fix this symmetry by becoming more like the real human being they were cloned from, the legendary soldier, Big Boss. Thematically, all this drives home the central question of whether we are slaves to our own genetic destinies. The possibility of genetic engineering seems to allow us a mastery over our own DNA in ways that wouldn't otherwise, of course, be possible. But this drive to tweak our own design and to discover its origins may itself be drives given to us by genes themselves. From the danger of genetic engineering to another major scientific subject of note for MGS1, the environmental, not to mention national security impact of storing nuclear waste and nuclear weapons, MGS1 makes clear that humans have what it takes to render our own species extinct. Another issue of scientific importance for MGS1 was the fear after the Cold War of a so-called post-Soviet brain drain. Former Russian nuclear scientists, not to mention nuclear technology and materials, were capable of winding up in the wrong hands of anyone with enough money. The bookkeeping wasn't the best as former Soviet states like Uzbekistan collapsed, and the problem of nuclear materials going missing from storage facilities, MGS-1 teaches us, is called MUF, Materials Unaccounted For. 
At the same time, states like Pakistan, North Korea, and China were engaging in the biggest threat to world peace in the 1990s, apart from terrorism, nuclear proliferation. All terrorists theoretically needed to complete a nuclear weapon was now possible for them to obtain for the first time. And rumors of missing nukes were everywhere in former Eastern Bloc countries in the 1990s. But even the radioactive byproducts of nuclear development posed a threat to the environment and potentially a furtherance of nuclear proliferation. Though in reality a secret R&D plant on the surface, Shadow Moses Island and MGS-1 is a storage facility for old nuclear weapons and yes, nuclear waste. As our support character Nastasha Romanenko explains, if the casing of one of these nukes is broken, plutonium would rapidly spread throughout the body and it only takes one one millionth of a gram of plutonium to cause cancer. Naturally, nuclear weapons contain plutonium. Most of the radiation emitted by plutonium isotopes consists of alpha rays. The ionization effects are strong, but if they are kept in containers, there is no danger of exposure. But if plutonium enters the body through breathing or other contact, it is quickly absorbed into the bones and internal organs. After that, there is no way to remove it. Once that happens, the victim will be constantly exposed to it, and just one, one millionth of a gram of plutonium can cause cancer. That is why a plutonium leak is such a serious danger. Later in the game, part of the level actually contains toxic radioactive runoff from the laboratories overhead. This sludge is often buried in the real world in so-called geological repositories to be left alone long term. Some critics argue that, as time goes by, these repositories can become, to quote 1998's The Proliferation Risks of Plutonium Mines, from science and global security, relatively low-cost sources of fissile material for nuclear weapons, i.e. plutonium mines. End quote. Whether dropped in a repository or kept in retrievable storage, nuclear waste seems always to present a risk that in theory it might be recoverable and repurposable for creating more nuclear weapons. Given our selfish genes, can we avoid disasters that may arise from things like DNA manipulation and nuclear proliferation? Why, even after the Cold War for that matter, are nuclear weapons not only still existing, but like a dangerous gene of their own, rapidly proliferating? These are just some of the scientific, moral, cultural, and philosophical questions at the end of the 20th century that MGS-1 raised. Well, that does it for this episode. Should it get over, say, 30,000 views, we'll return with a follow-up video on the science of MGS-2. Until next time, boss. <laughs>